and welcome back to the lecture series on performative gender and religions in South Asia. So now we are discussing tribal traditions and performances and uh, today our lecture is going to mainly focus on the Santal tribe, right. So before we uh, start uh, the lecture, uh, let us take a look at the Jaher Thaan. This is the uh, sacred uh, site uh, of worship for the Santals uh, and similarly all tribes have these uh, sites and these sites are located at the heart of the nature. So like I was uh, telling uh, the, the core philosophy that informs that inspires uh, the Santali religion as well as the religion of the tribal people in uh, India in South Asia is uh, you know uh, preservation of forestry, preservation of vegetation. So, this is uh, the picture of Jaher Thaan in uh, a village in Baripada, Odisha, right. So, uh, usually it is made up of sal and mahua trees, right, which are considered as very useful and thereby sacred uh, trees for the Santals. Now, the first festival that we discuss today is Harir Sim. Harir Sim is celebrated in the month of July and August uh, on the occasion of germination of seeds when seeds start germinating after uh, they push out uh, the new shoots uh, Harir Sim is celebrated. So, the Santals offer their sacrifices to the spirits or bongas with the intention of a lush paddy harvest, right. Uh, this is just hearkening back from our uh, previous lecture where we are talking about how the tribal religions are very much interested in the uh, uh, secular motives, the motives of survival and the uh, socio-economic interests. So, uh, you know, sustenance and protection of cattle, of uh, crops and harvest are uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, reasons, some of the incentives that uh, lead to the, uh, the, you know, th that lead to the origin or that, uh, that uh, explain the origin of these festivals. So, uh, before the day of Harir Sim, uh, the Nike or the village priest uh, fasts and he is the one that has to observe uh, some kind of you know uh, austerity prior to the rituals. Uh, on the day of uh, Harir Sim, uh, after taking a bath, uh, Nike visits the Jaher Thaan, the picture of Jaher Thaan that I have showed just now, right. Uh, the Nike or the priest visits the Jaher Thaan with a winnowing fan containing flour, and other items such as sindoor or the vermilion and uh, fowls for sacrifice. So, the Nike or priest sacrifices the fowls on behalf of the entire village. The sacrifice is made, uh, you know, de or dedicated to the spirits of the village, the major spirits being Marangburu, Jaherera, Gosaiera, Morekuturuiko. Pargana Bonga and the Sima Bongas. Uh, when the Nike returns home, he makes an offer of rice beer or hariya to all the villagers. So, here the picture that emerges is that of a very pan village or a pan communal uh, celebration where uh, prayers are not made, uh, you know, looking at or keeping in mind individual interests. Rather, uh, you know, it is the protection of the entire community, betterment of the entire village that is uh, sought uh, through these worships, through these rituals. Just like uh, in the case of Eroxim, uh, a festival that we have already discussed in our previous lecture, uh, in the case of Harir Sim also, people are refrained from transplanting the paddy unless the public worship is uh, performed and completed. So, no individual family can, uh, you know, go ahead uh, in, in, in transplanting the paddy before the performance of Harir Sim. If uh, the family does so, uh, it would bring a curse, it would bring a, a, a calamity to the entire village, to the entire community. So, that is uh, considered as a taboo. The entire village has to function. Uh, alike uh, in in a in tandem right 
Next we are going to discuss uh, Janthar. Uh, now Janthar is a festival that is celebrated uh, as the first fruits of the harvest are considered as sacred right as a way of celebrating the uh, the the ripening of or the blossoming of the first fruits janthar is observed the importance of all these rituals right uh, uh, harir sim erok sim uh, janthar uh, is reflected in the fact that anyone eating uh, the the produce it could be paddy it could be the fruits before the ritual is observed is considered as a taboo so no one can partake a share of uh, the harvest or or the produce before it is offered to the respective deities if one does then uh, 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 the, the person will incur some kind of wrath from the deities and uh, the community could uh, face uh, some hard times some you know difficult times uh, after you know uh, after after, after transgressing uh, the uh, laws so uh, the honoring of the spirits is done through offering them these first fruits just like i was saying all the first harvests are uh, dedicated to the different deities just so they are propitiated they are pleased the santals have multiple festivals related to offering the first fruits to their bongas or spirits and uh, this uh, includes uh, irigundli navai and uh, uh, janthar now in janthar we see the naiki or priest uh, putting the ears of paddy in the winnowing fan along with other items uh, that are intended for uh, sacrifice intended for being dedicated to the deities. Uh, accompanied by other men, uh, Nike uh, goes to the Jahirthan and uh, he salutes, he pays his obeisance to the Sarjum tree, Sarjum tree, which is uh, one of the sacred uh, you know trees uh, in Santal belief system. And uh, Sarjum actually represents the Pargana Bonga. So, it is very, very sacred and it needs to be worshipped. What is observable here is that women are uh, throughout absent from these direct ritual performances. So, uh, I was showing the picture of this Jayarthan where uh, women would usually not visit, right? Women's bodies are not considered as pure and so they cannot visit uh, the uh, direct uh, site of worship only a man has uh, the, the prerogative uh, to carry out the uh, rituals. They can only accompany uh, the males of the village uh, from uh, background through some background services. So, following uh, the ritual of Janthar, an animal is sacrificed and its head is uh, you know offered to the Nike, it is taken to the Nike's house. Further, offerings are made to the spirits and the ancestors of every household. I also mentioned how the ancestors play a seminal role and a very important role in the belief system, in the worldview of the tribal people. It is believed that the ancestors may have, you know, given up their uh, earthly bodies, their earthly bodies may have been demolished uh, and decayed, but the spirit uh, still remains in the bhitar of the uh, household and that needs to be uh, worshipped, that needs to be uh, kind of propitiated at the beginning of all festivals. So, uh, the end of the rituals uh, lifts the taboo on eating the fruits. So, once Janthar is properly uh, observed and performed by the Nike, uh, the rest of the village can now partake a share of the uh, new uh, produce of uh, seasonal fruits. Next, Baksim, uh, this festival of the Santal community is also related to the, uh, to the production of first fruits. So, the celebration is made in January, February before the reaping of the thatching grass, uh, which marks the end of the Santal year, right. Again, there are sacrifices uh, that are made by the priest to the village spirits invoking these uh, you know demigods for the multiplication uh, for the 
flourishing of the Saudi crop, uh, which is followed by elaborate meal uh, of the villagers together, right. So, along with religious meanings, we see that these feasts also carry socio-political aspects such as in during the Marxism, it is time for the heads to give up their positions also. So, if uh, the, the positions of the headmen and the other important men of the village need to be changed, uh, they need to be replaced by uh, someone younger or uh, some other member marks him is the right time during the feast, uh, you know, the next head or the next, uh, you know, uh, officiating uh, uh, men from the village are also decided. So, they are not only religious in nature, they also have their own secular uh, socio-political significance. Next, I am going to talk about Karam, Karam uh, Puja or Karam uh, festival. Uh, now, unlike other festivals, Karam festival is not an annual ceremony and uh, it is not meant to be performed regularly. Uh, scholar J. Throsi, who has extensively worked on the Santals, uh, writes that uh, it is believed that Karam has been borrowed from the neighboring, uh, you know, Hindu society uh, by the Santals. Uh, further, W. J. Uh, Kulshaw would say that many songs that are written during the festival that are written uh, uh, to, to celebrate the Karam Puja contain references to the heroes uh, from Ramayana. So, they have direct allusion to Ramayana which is a, uh, a Sanskrit uh, myth which belongs to the mainstream Hindu uh, uh, culture. So, we see Karam as uh, an evidence, uh, as uh, an instance of exchange between the tribal population and the abetting Hindu population, right. There have been many such instances of exchanges uh, between uh, the Hindus and the Santals, a lot of their culture, their rituals, their marriage, birth uh, and death ceremonies uh, match, right. So, uh, now, Scholars would say that this uh, could mean uh, that uh, the, the cultures, you know, the tribals and the Hindus uh, uh, drew on each other's traditions. It could also mean that they uh, individually had these, uh, these beliefs in their own culture. They have not actually taken from one another, right. So, for example, nature worship to an extent is also present in uh, the, the Vedic chants uh, that, that are part of the Brahminical tradition. In uh, Karam Puja, the songs of uh, the festival are recited uh, by the elders uh, from the village uh, and uh, these songs contain the story of the origin of uh, man and the division of the tribe as per the Santal custom, how the different clans were formed, the origin of uh, the Santals from Pilchu Haram and Pilchu Buri, the first man and woman respectively. So, during the Karam Puja, the villagers go for merrymaking through dancing and singing. Uh, two branches of Karam tree are uh, brought from the forest. So, the youth that bring the branches from the forest uh, go there dancing and singing accompanied by the drums, right. Uh, so, it is a festival of performance as we can see and afterwards we see that the elders from the village start reciting the Karam Binti which is the story of creation and division of the uh, tribal clans and sub clans. Uh, the end of the recital is again followed by uh, dancing and singing. So, Jethroasi writes that the festival, uh, the Karam festival leads to uh, the creation of certain taboo relationships, certain relationships that are otherwise uh, considered as taboo within the village community. For example, young unmarried people from the same uh, sex who want to uh, formalize, who want to uh, socialize uh, their relationship and give it uh, the form of a uh, lifelong friendship, uh, enter uh, into a kind of a, uh, uh, understanding or into a bond publicly into a you know into a uh, friendship alliance uh, 
within the public domain during this festival. So, in front of everyone, they, cons they confess their lifelong friendship. Uh, the, the two individuals, the two parties involved uh, in this process of, of confessing their friendship exchange karam buds and they fix these buds in each other's hair as a way of formalizing their friendship in the presence of uh, all the villages that are gathered for the festival. Along with uh, linking the two friends who promise each other mutual uh, economic assistance in times of needs, uh, the alliance puts one of them uh, into a new relationship with the other's family. Uh, this is to say that this friendship is not uh, only restricted or limited between the two men, but it is extended to the respective families too. Now, the fa families also become alliance in a uh, or, or allies. Now, the families also become allies in a formal manner uh, and they uh, vouch, uh, they, they promise to assist uh, one another economically in, in, in times of needs. So, now the friendship is extended to the families, the respective uh, families too, uh, such that uh, they, they vouch, they promise that they will be uh, assisting uh, one another uh, in times of uh, economic crisis and other needs. Let us take a look at the Karam dance, which is a very prominent, you know, style of dancing among the uh, Santals, the Santal tribe. Let us take a look right and when we talk to the santal people we ask them how why they dance the way they do uh, they would say that they are uh, emulating the cosmic movements right with and we will see uh, you know karam leaves in their hands uh, ideally they have karam leaves in their hands if not they have some colored uh, you know handkerchiefs uh, in their hands with which uh, they dance, they are wearing very colorful clothes, uh, especially in this uh, video, the, the lower garments are traditional. We can see that they are uh, wearing their uh, traditional uh, attire uh, in, in the lower part of their body and even the, the peacock uh, feathers in their, um, in their headgear is uh, part of their traditional attire that they wear during their performance, right? So, so we see that the men are emulating what they call as the, uh, you know, the, the symbolic moves uh, uh, representing rotation and revolution, right? So, they are um, exchanging positions among themselves and then they are also making a circular progress, a circular movement uh, around the field. So, they assert that this is uh, following the cosmic movement, uh, the way the planetary bodies, the cosmic bodies uh, move in an orbit, right? Even the steppings. So, yesterday we were talking about uh, the ritual codes. So, here Dhwani, Mudra, Mantra, everything uh, kind of goes together to create um, a, a fantastic impact, right? The hand movements, the leg movements, all of them, according to the Santal, have their, uh, you know, scientific meaning. They follow the natural order. They, um, they are just uh, representing the macrocosm through the microcosm of the uh, body or the microcosmic movements of the body, right? So, we have the drummers here uh, playing the tamak and the tumbak and uh, we have an audience comprising the tribal population that sits and watches uh, this performance, right? Uh, so, this is happening in a natural environment uh, and this is, uh, you know, the Karam dance. So, next we are going to talk about uh, Jomsim and Makmur. Jomsim is a clan based celebration. It is a celebration to honor the sun god. Uh, that is uh, known as the Singh Bonga uh, by the uh, among the Santals. So, the, uh, it is in honor of the sun god that is called as the Singh Bonga by the Santals. Uh, now, Jomsin 
was uh, originally supposed to be celebrated once in a lifetime. Similarly, Markmoor festival was intended to be celebrated at the interval of five years. In Markmoor festival, uh, the sacrifice of a white goat was supposed to be performed as an offering to the deities in order to keep the village free from sickness. However, we see that uh, uh, these uh, performances have become uh, rarer with the progression of time. In the, in the current times, uh, uh, not always uh, are festivals like Jomsim and Mahmoor uh, observed, right? They are not observed in the way they should be traditionally observed. They are prescribed to be observed, right? The possible reason uh, for the disappearance or, or, or uh, kind of the evanescence of uh, some of these festivals could be the expense of the sacrificial animal uh, required for this purpose. It's, uh, it is cost bearing for the Santal to carry out uh, these uh, festivals, these uh, observances, right? Next, we are going to talk about the annual hunt. The annual hunt or Disom Sendra, uh, as the tribals call it, is another festive occasion which manifests the intimate relationship between the Santals and their deities. So, along with uh, agriculture, hunting also used to be a principal mode of uh, living for the Santals. So, although the Santals are um, settlers and agro-based uh, economy, they also used to be hunter-gatherers, right? These were the two uh, primary uh, modes of living for the Santal people. Now, hunting was supposed to be done only by the men and those men who uh, avoided hunting were considered as cowards. So, from this uh, one can see how uh, gendered definitions of certain activities are etched out uh, and uh, correspondingly women are excluded from certain uh, you know certain very masculine activities such as hunting. Women are not supposed to take part in hunting among the Santals. So, there are two types of Santal hunting expeditions. One is the Disom Sendra, the other is Por Sendra. On the eve of the hunt, uh, the Naikyo priest uh, from uh, every village uh, sacrifices the fowls for the safety of the villagers who will you know go out on hunting uh, and also as a way of praying for a good catch. So, on gathering together the Dhiri, the hunting priest also known as Dhiri performs the sacrificial ritual to the Bongas. Uh, a ritual involving a uh, sindur, uh, flour, rice and a fowl is carried out. And then once the sacrifice is over, the uh, instrument tamak is played and this serves as a sign of the hunt to commence, right? So, at this point, it would be important uh, to note uh, that uh, traditionally the Santals uh, would not have a very calendrical sense of time, right? Uh, when would the hunting festival commence uh, for the, the, you know, the, especially the forefathers of the Santals that we have today uh, who did not have, uh, uh, you know, the concept of calendar or time as a measurable uh, a physical unit. They did not have the sense of clock or calendar. Uh, so, for these, uh, you know, uh, these, these ancestors, uh, it is said that uh, uh, on the day of, uh, on, on a particular uh, day of uh, full moon in spring, uh, the Santals from uh, uh, Anga, Banga and Kalinga referring to uh, you know the, the entire eastern belt of India. So, from Jharkhand, from Bengal and Kalinga meaning from Odisha, the Santals from Anga, Banga and Kalinga would uh, gather in the Ayodhya mountains for hunting. They would understand that full moon day uh, is uh, the time for hunting. So, they had a very seasonal uh, understanding of time rather than calendrical, uh, you know, uh, conception. So, uh, even during the hunt, 
certain rituals are observed uh, such as when hitting uh, a small game uh, its name needs to be shouted so that the other villages are informed and I was also talking about uh, Santal people being a very shared community. So, a hunt is not or a game uh, is not uh, enjoyed or, or uh, you know taken entirely by the person that has hunted. It needs to be shared with the other village members and uh, the hunter himself will only partake a certain share of the game. That is how uh, the, the understanding goes. So, Next we are going to talk about annual hunt and women. So, though women are not allowed to take part in the hunt, they observe several taboos while the men are away hunting. So, the purpose of these taboos is to avert the evil eye. So, no harm befalls uh, the men. So, uh, for example, women are not allowed to wear flowers uh, in their hair or even iron bangles. Uh, on looking clear, closely uh, at these customs, some of the contemporary critics and scholars would say that one can deduce that while men are away busy in their rivalry, in their merry making, uh, uh, you know, preventing the woman from uh, decoration could be a way of stopping them from, uh, you know, any kind of sexual activity in the absence of their men folk. So, women not decorating themselves means that they would uh, stay chaste while their men are away. These rules are meant to regulate uh, the, the feminine sexuality among the Santhals. Now, Dehri or the hunting uh, priest's wife is uh, actually held responsible for any malevolent activities uh, that happen while the men are away hunting, right? The, the uh, hunting priest's wife takes care of the women folk and kind of curbs all their excesses while the uh, men folk are away. So, Dhiri's wife is supposed to stay back in her home and should not approach anywhere near the forest or the village outskirts uh, lest something befalls on the hunters. So, it is uh, a kind of uh, we see uh, very male centric uh, belief system also where uh, women's presence in uh, some of the homosocial activities uh, be it uh, you know performance of rituals in Jahar Thaan or uh, hunting is considered as uh, something pejorative, something uh, having a negative uh, value or meaning. So, uh, this can be seen as a way of restraining the movement of uh, the Santali women. No animal or fowl is supposed to be killed by the Santal women in the absence of uh, the men and this could be understood as a way of restricting women from participating in the mainstream communal activities. These infringements are believed to prevent the success of the hunt. If women transgress any of these prescriptions, uh, handed down by their ancestors, then it would uh, bring about bad luck to the men that have gone out for hunting. So, I would like to stop our lecture here today and before stopping, uh, here is a fantastic wonderful video of the Santhali women dancing together and the men playing their traditional instruments. And uh, it has a resounding effect. Uh, it echoes especially when performed in an open field like this, right? We can see that the leg and hand movements are so beautifully coordinated. Even though they are not uh, looking at their own feet, they are moving together, right? So, with this, I am going to stop my lecture here today and I will meet you again in another lecture. Thank you.